Welcome back, VITA volunteers, for the second half of the Advanced Business Income lesson covering material from IRS Publication 4491. In part one, we talked about how to define and recognize business income. We covered some scope issues for the VITA program, and we got a high level overview of how business income flows onto the 1040 tax return through Schedule C. In this video, we will take a closer look at the Schedule C and talk about some common business expenses as well as record keeping and record reconstruction. So before we really dig in, we're just going to take a zoomed out view of the Schedule C and look at its parts and how they fit together. Um, this is very similar to what we did in the filing basics lesson in the, in the basic uh, course, where we just kind of took this uh, overview to see, you know, the, the different parts. So our Schedule C on the front page here, it has a top section is for general information about uh, the business and, um, you know, the, the way that the accounting is being done for that business. Um, part one is for income. Um, so that's where we pull together all of the uh, in sources of, of monies. Um, and then part two is the expense section. And part three uh, are some calculations. There's the business use of home uh, and some uh, check boxes for if, if our um, taxpayer were to have come to a loss, which by the way is out of scope for us. So then the second page begins with the cost of goods sold. And again, here's another section that for the VITA program is out of scope out of scope, but that's if a uh, business had inventory, they were selling goods. And then uh, we have uh, part four is for vehicle information, if there's business use of a vehicle and the uh, taxpayer wants to take the standard mileage rate. And then there's part five, which is just some other expenses, which we'll get into that a little bit more in a few slides. So now here's our closer look and we're taking that uh, very top section. So again, this is general information about the business. For a lot of our VITA clients, they aren't really operating um, under a separate uh, business name than themselves. They, they might not have an employer identification number. They're just essentially operating as, as themselves, which is totally fine. Um, when we enter this into Tax Slayer, we actually really just don't enter anything into Tax Slayer. You'll notice that the fields say, if the same as the taxpayer, leave blank. We do, however, need to provide some idea of what this business is doing. Um, so you'll be typing in, you know, what is the principal business or profession profession that is uh, that this uh, business is engaging in, and then there's this code. Um, it's a special code um, for business activity, business or professional activities, and there's a couple of ways that you can find out what code is this type of business going to have. Um, first of all, Tax Slayer. Um, on the Schedule C input screen um, has, it's the basic information input screen, has a, uh, a little link or button that you push um, and it pulls up a, a, a window and you can search um, based on some keywords or you can scroll down until you find um, the appropriate code to go with the type of activity that is being performed. Um, another place that you can get these activity codes is in the instructions for Schedule C, and there's a chart at the end. Um, you can see I put a little picture there, uh, the principal business or professional activity codes, and you can see they're, you know, um, divided up into, you know, types of activities and then even further divided um, into, into certain codes depending on, on what what they're doing within those um, types of activities. 
So we're still in this first section where we're just providing some general information about the business, um, but we're heading on down to these little check boxes. And uh, line F is just asking the accounting method. And if you'll remember from our business part one, the only type of accounting method that is in scope for VITA is the cash accounting method. So we do not do accrual and um, there's a hybrid form of accounting method, which we also don't do. The next question is asking if the taxpayer materially participated in this business, in the operation of this business. And uh, for VITA, again, it's only in scope if the taxpayer materially participated. And to be honest, I don't think I've ever seen a client come in who was not materially participating in, in their business. Um, it, Usually material part participation means that, you know, this this taxpayer is actively engaged in, you know, uh, the operation of the business or, you know, making decisions for the business, those kinds of things. Um, but, you know, if you ever ran across a situation where it was kind of questionable about whether um, this taxpayer was materially uh, participating, you can always look up in publication 925. Um, there's some some special tests for material participation. And so um, you can use that as a resource. And then we have a couple of questions about 1099s. So um, did the client make any payments in the tax year that would require uh, them to file form 1099 so a payment to a single individual of six hundred dollars or more they need to be filing a 1099 for that individual and um, and then the second question is if yes uh, did you or uh, will you file those 1099s now again 1099s as we learned in our business income part one this is going to be an out of scope return for us. So we will need to refer this person to a paid preparer if either of well, if the first answer is yes, and then it doesn't matter whether the second answer is yes or no, if they are required to file 1099s, whether they already did or whether they need to still, um, we're going to be referring them to a paid preparer for the year. So on to part one, where we start to look at the income for this business. Uh, you can see line one is the gross receipts or sales. And for our clientele, generally speaking, um, the way that a Schedule C starts is they bring us a Form 1099 of some kind. Um, uh, again, we looked at uh, what types of 1099s we might be seeing in our business income part one. Um, so generally when we uh, work through the flow of tax layer, we're going to be going into the input screen for that 1099. And then uh, once we finish inputting that 1099, uh, the software cues us and says, hey, do you want to attach this to a Schedule C? And of course, if this is uh, the first document that you've input uh, for this Schedule C, um, you're going to say, yes, but I need to create a new one. Um, so there's there's an option for that. And that's usually how you kind of flow into preparing the Schedule C. Now, uh, aside from the 1099 forms, again, again we have our statutory employees. Um, they're going to uh, have a W-2, so you'll go through the W-2 input screen and uh, you'll be checking the box that says this is a statutory employee. Again, tax layer will cue you at the end saying, hey, why don't you attach this to a Schedule C? And so you say, thanks, I will. Um, the kind of difference between the way the 1099s flow through the software and the statutory employees flow through the software, the 1099s usually um, will automatically bring over the amount that was on that 1099. The, the W-2 for the statutory employee, you end up uh, entering that amount of uh, statutory employee compensation again when you get to the Schedule C. And as always, don't forget cash, because even though a lot of our clients do come in with a 1099, uh, a lot of our clients might be in uh, industries where they would be getting, you know, some sort of a cash tip or um, they, they might be having some cash uh, flow through certain transactions somewhere. 
And we need to remind them that, you know, we're not helping them do anything under the table and um, this all needs to get reported. Um, and so, you know, particularly again, if you're having a client come in who is from like a ride share or any other industry where, where tips are common, um, just really making sure that we that we ask, um, are you sure you didn't have any cash tips? Um, because those do need to be reported. They are a source of income and um, you wouldn't want to be uh, in a situation where uh, somebody came asking about the uh, your your income and you had forgotten to report something. So aside from our gross receipts and our calculation lines, a couple of other lines in this section are for returns and allowances and costs of goods sold, which again, costs of goods sold has to do with inventory. And both of those situations are out of scope. So um, hopefully you've kind of talked to your taxpayer before you're, you're to the point where you're entering things into the return. Um, just to find out, you know, do you have returns and allowances? Did you have inventory? If they had any of those, then they would need to see a paid preparer for the current year. So then we have our part two, which is for expenses. And these are kind of general expenses that um, lots of businesses have. Um, and we'll look a little bit closer at um, the particular kinds of expenses that we as VITA volunteers can help our clients with. So we're going to navigate away from the Schedule C for a minute while we look at that. Before we get into the nitty gritty of each particular kind of expense, I want to cover this concept of ordinary and necessary. All ordinary and necessary expenses that are incurred in a self-employed taxpayer's business must be reported. An ordinary expense is one that is common and accepted in the taxpayer's industry, and a necessary expense is one that is helpful and appropriate for the taxpayer's trade or business. Now, it's important to note that that does not mean that the expense has to be indispensable to be considered necessary. Helpful and appropriate is the right term. So uh, as we're guiding our clients through decisions about whether things are going to be uh, deductible as business expenses, um, they, they do have some judgment over what is helpful and appropriate to pour their trader business. We're just help, there to help guide them um, in making sure that that is compliant with, with the law and that um, they're, they're not pushing boundaries where they shouldn't be pushing boundaries. So now we can start talking about particular kinds of expenses that we as VITA volunteers are able to help our Schedule C clients with. So first of all is advertising, and that's pretty straightforward. Um, it can include internet ads, newspapers, magazines, billboards, racing sponsors, television spots, anything to promote the business. Commissions and fees are deductible, but again, remember that for VITA, we are only looking at commissions and fees that were less than $600 per individual, the per uh, person that the business owner paid. Um, otherwise, it's going to be out of scope. And why is that? Well, because then if it's over that amount, they'll need to be issuing a 1099, and that is an out of scope situation for us, regardless of whether they already issued that 1099 or whether they still need to. So uh, insurance is another business expense. So this is uh, for business liability or property. It's important to note this is not for uh, vehicles, a business vehicle that is taking the standard mileage rate. Um, the uh, cost of insurance is rolled up into that mileage rate. Um, so, so you wouldn't add the insurance on top of that as an extra deduction. And then it's also important to note that this is not for the health insurance of the owner and the family. Um, that is taken uh, elsewhere on the return as an adjustment to, to income. So it does not actually show up on the Schedule C, but they do get a tax benefit for it. Interest is another uh, business expense. Uh, this is important to note that this is for like business operating loans, or it could be the business portion of a car loan. And that can happen even when the client is taking the standard mileage deduction. So they can take the standard mileage and uh, interest on the, on the Schedule C. 
Um, but it is not for home mortgage interest. Then there's legal and professional services. So if they uh, paid money to a professional such as a lawyer or an accountant, um, but it is not if, uh, if those payments were made uh, in the process of acquiring property. Um, that isn't an expense that gets added to the basis of that property, which um, if they're working with basis, it's probably gonna be an out of scope return for us. Um, but uh, other, other types of uh, services, professional services, uh, could possibly be in scope for us. Um, a tricky area with this is um, really kind of digging in. There can be a lot of confusion with clients about what was uh, legal and professional services for their business versus themselves. So, um, you know, if it's for, for a will or for personal taxes, those kinds of things, um, then those are, are personal services. They're not deductible. Um, if it was just strictly for the business, then it is deductible on the Schedule C. Then we have the office expense, and this is generally used for office supplies, uh, things like pens, papers, postage, that kind of stuff. Rent or leases are other uh, expenses that can be deducted on a Schedule C. Generally, you're going to see this for cars, trucks, vans, machinery, equipment. Um, but it's important that you notice that uh, we do have some scope issues with, with leasing. So any vehicle leases that were for more than 30 days, those are out of scope unless, um, well, it, it won't show up on this line, but it is possible that the client could take the standard mileage rate um, based on the usage of a vehicle that was leased, but they will not be having any lease expense on this line. And then uh, we have repairs and maintenance. Um, another kind of little tricky area is just making sure that these are repairs and maintenance, um, you know, things that kind of regularly break down, wear out. Um, these uh, should not be for things that are uh, considered improvements. They wouldn't um, greatly extend the life of, of whatever uh, this is or, or make it usable uh, for a new purpose. Um, there's, there's tests regarding whether uh, something is a repair or, or an improvement. Um, if you have a question about something like that, you can always look up in publication 535 uh, for clarification. And then we also have uh, supplies, so not just office supplies, but other general operating supplies. Um, this one is not for inventory. Um, remember, in the first place, inventory is out of scope for us. Um, but if it was uh, something that was being purchased for inventory, it would show up in a different part of, of the Schedule C. Business owners can deduct taxes and licenses, um, but uh, taxes and licenses do not include fines or penalties that are paid to a government uh, for breaking the law. So, you know, for instance, if somebody uh, receives a late penalty on some taxes, they can't deduct that late penalty. It's not deductible. Uh, travel and meals. So this is for travel that's away from home or the metro area of, of the client where they generally operate. Um, and it needs to be mainly for a business purpose. So for instance, if somebody is mainly traveling to go to a convention uh, for their business, um, and then maybe they do a little bit of sightseeing, um, some of those expenses will be deductible uh, because the travel was mainly for business. If the travel was mainly for uh, pleasure, so for instance, if they were going on a family vacation and while they're there, uh, they no happen to notice that there's a convention, they sign up for that, um, the, the travel portion of those expenses uh, would not be deductible. They could still uh, deduct the uh, convention fees if they had to pay an, an entrance fee or a ticket, um, but they wouldn't be able to deduct their travel expenses. So the purpose has to mainly be for business. 
And then new for 21 and 22, meals at restaurants are deductible at 100%. Um, this is uh, different in years prior. Uh, you could only deduct 50% of meals. Um, but with, with COVID, um, they're trying to encourage people to go out to restaurants um, and support the, that industry. Utilities are uh, another type of business expense, but it's also important to make sure with our clients that this really was for the business and not for personal. Um, because we don't do the home office deduction, this is a little less um, of, a, of a gray area that we have to deal with. Um, we just refer them to a, to a paid preparer um, so, but you know, if, if you see somebody that's trying to claim utilities, um, make sure that they have an office space that is separate from their home. So navigating back to the Schedule C, uh, we're just under that grid where we had all those different kinds of expenses. Um, you, you total those up and you have a couple of um, calculation lines. Well then below that you have the uh, expenses for the business use of your home. Um, so this is a possibility that taxpayers could uh, take the business use of their home as a deduction. However, for our program, that is out of scope. And so if somebody is wanting to, to uh, use this deduction, then we need to refer them to a paid preparer. And then um, we move down the line to uh, where we're calculating our net profit or loss. And remember, a net loss is going to be out of scope for us. So again, it's kind of important to gather all of the records of, of the client and, um, you know, do a quick calculation. Most of our Schedule C's are quite small, so, you know, you're not going to be sitting there for hours trying to calculate something that's better done by software. You can usually do a pretty quick calculation to figure out whether or not they're going to be at a loss or whether they're going to be at a profit. So if net losses, um, we need to send them to a paid preparer. Um, and these little check boxes down at the bottom uh, have to do with a taxpayer having a net loss um, and how much they're allowed to take on their return. So then we move around to page two of the Schedule C, um, which begins with part three, cost of goods sold, which is our inventory. And um, that's just going to be out of scope altogether for us. Now part four is in scope for us. This is where we calculate out um, the uh, mileage deduction or deduction for car and truck expenses based on the standard mileage rate. Just a reminder, the, the car and truck deduction uh, is only in scope for the VITA program if the taxpayer is using that standard mileage rate. So if they're trying to use actual expenses, again, we need to let them know that uh, they will need to find a paid preparer for the current year if that's what they're doing. So the standard mileage rate, uh, the IRS publishes that and updates it each year. This year, it's going to be uh, 58.5 cents per mile. And um, the driver or the uh, taxpayer needs to allocate the miles between uh, business, commuting, and other miles. So um, they can't just take all of the uh, miles on that vehicle. Um, they, they have to only take the business miles. Uh, commuting and other miles are not deductible. So, and then they need to have written evidence to support this deduction. And uh, I think for a lot of our taxpayers, uh, they forget to keep a mileage log. Um, and we do have some ability to help them uh, recreate, recreate that um, log and that support, that written evidence. We'll talk about that uh, towards, the, towards the end of this slideshow. Um, but but they do need to have that written evidence, uh, which you know includes the the miles and the um, the purpose of of that um, trip. And then uh, the other things that we're going to need to take the car and truck expense based on the mileage rate, the standard mileage rate, uh, we need to know when the car was placed in service. Um, 
So when did they start using it for the business? And then uh, there's a couple of extra uh, checkbox kind of questions. So they need to check if this vehicle is available for their personal use um, outside of business hours. If it is, um, that's okay. They can still take the deduction, um, but the, it's information that the IRS wants to know. And then uh, also they'll be answering if there is another vehicle available for personal use. Um, a little bit more about the uh, commuting versus business miles. Uh, this is a graphic that I uh, pulled out of the publication 4012 just to kind of help you visualize what is a commuting mile versus what is a business mile. So commuting miles are generally, you know, to and from your, your home to your work. So, you know, when you go from home to work, at the beginning of the day, that's your commute. And when you come home from work to, um, to your home, that's also part of your commute, and that's not deductible. Um, however, some of our clients might be going to several locations during the day. They might not just have one place of business, um, in which case uh, it gets a little more complicated. Um, but generally speaking, the, uh, the mileage from their home to the first place that they go is considered a commute. And then when they uh, travel from that first place of business to a second place of business, um, that can be a business mile. And then um, whatever they do during the day, um, you know, between work locations, but when they go to their last location, their last stop, and to their home, uh, that would be considered a commuting mile. Um, and this can get a little bit tricky with our, our taxpayers that are doing um, delivery services or ride sharing services. Um, so where wherever they are located, if they're located at home, you know, to that first location, um, that's going to be commuting. Um, and then when they, they pick up their uh, person who's writing and take them to wherever, then that begins the business mile and miles. And then um, when they're when they're heading back home, then then it becomes a commute again. So the last part of our Schedule C is just a, a generic other expenses. Uh, Part. And you can see there's a little line there for an explanation and then, you know, line for, for the monetary amount. And again, just because um, whatever expense they had was not specifically listed before, um, if it's ordinary and necessary for their business, they're still going to deduct it. And so this is the space where they would do that. So a couple of uh, expenses that could end up in this other expense area are things like education. Um, now, in order to be able to deduct education on the Schedule C, it needs to be something that is uh, for the business. And so it would be a type of education that would uh, maintain or improve the job skills of the taxpayer. Um, and then it could be something that's required by law or regulation. So if they're in an, in an industry that requires some sort of certification or so many training hours per uh, period of time, those would be deductible as education expenses on the Schedule C. Another type of other expense we talked about a little bit in our business income uh, part one lesson and that's the safe harbor de minimis and if you'll remember um, that's for personal property items items that uh, generally uh, without this de minimis would need to be uh, depreciated over time um, but the de minimis allows businesses uh, so long as it's uh, part of their regular accounting procedures um, to uh, expense items that are uh, if the item or the invoice is less than $2,500 each, um, or if they have a, a different um, policy that's a lower amount, then, then they would be expensing that lower amount. Um, and then they would need to attach a statement uh, saying that this is the safe harbor de minimis um, in, in order to, to expense this item. 
So let's talk a little bit about record keeping. This can be a real challenge for um, some of our clients, um, a, lo a lot especially because um, we'll have clients come in and maybe for the first time this year, uh, my examples are always the ride share and the delivery, but that's the one that I tend to see most often, um, where people, you know, they maybe want a little extra income or, you know, they got laid off and they, they, um, they want to try this for a little bit and they don't really realize um, that they are now needing to keep records and that they're going to be uh, filing the Schedule C as a business. Um, an another instance is um, sometimes people are surprised when uh, whoever they're working for treats them like a contractor as opposed to an employee, or they don't understand that, that there's a difference between um, filing your taxes as an employee versus uh, filing your taxes when you're an independent contractor. Um, so uh, a lot of times we're catching people on their first go at this, um, and so they didn't realize that they should have been keeping records. And so we do a lot of you know, education about what they need to keep, why they should keep it, um, and, and sometimes helping them to recreate those records. So um, it's a good idea to just talk about the benefits and why we need to do this record keeping. Um, first of all, you know, you end up talking to them about, oh, this is, you know, uh, independent contracting income. Um, you know, you're, the person that you're working for is not uh, withholding taxes, um, but then you also get to uh, deduct some expenses. And so uh, if you want to owe fewer taxes, you really want to keep track of this stuff. So um, we talk about monitoring the process, progress of their business, um, preparing financial statements if they ever want to get outside funding to grow their business. Um, that could be an important reason to, to keep your records. Um, they might need to identify the source of receipts. Um, they uh, definitely are going to want to keep track of those deductible expenses. Um, and, and it helps with preparing the tax returns. And if they've kept uh, good records during the year, little, but, little bit by little bit, it makes the uh, tax return uh, process a lot more friendly. Um, and then, of course, supporting the items that are reported on tax returns. Um, you know, the, the worst is to have the IRS come back and say, well, wait a minute, you know, what's happening here? And then you didn't have record of it. Um, it's much easier to just, um, if, the, if the IRS sent a letter, be able to mail back whatever proof that you have, and that just um, makes it an open and shut case instead of um, dragging on and, and being incredibly stressful. There is flexibility with um, what kinds of specific records people can keep. Um, there's there's a few cases like with the mileage, um, the IRS wants to see some specific things um, to, in, in order for something to be good support for that deduction. Um, but there's not uh, necessarily uh, that detailed of guidance for everything. So um, taxpayers can choose any record keeping system that suits their business as long as it clearly shows their income and expenses. Um, so the things that they'll probably be wanting is a summary of uh, the business transactions. Um, so a lot of the really small businesses, it just ends up being, you know, their business checkbook. Um, if they're a little bit bigger and a little more comfortable with technology, maybe they're uh, keeping accounting journals and ledgers in some sort of a, an accounting system. Um, and then for supporting documents, they can keep sales slips, paid bills, invoices, receipts, deposit slips, canceled checks are all uh, generally good supporting documents. Again, for mileage, um, we want our taxpayers keeping a log of you know, the, the days and the times and the reason that they were traveling for business um, and then the mileage as well. And as I mentioned, um, we fairly often see uh, taxpayers come in that 
um, didn't realize that they should have been keeping records. And so we are there to help them understand what they, what kind of reconstruction they can do and should do um, to be able to support uh, what's happening on their tax returns. Um, so the goal of the re record reconstruction is to use what documentation you, uh, the, the client does have and um, kind of work with that to develop a sound and reasonable estimate of what the taxpayer's uh, business income and expenses were. Um, so our job as volunteers is to, you know, make adequate inquiries. So if you're, um, first of all, if they come in and they just don't have any records and they're, um, you know, just saying round numbers, we talked about that in our business income uh, lesson one, that that's kind of a red flag return for us. And so um, we really want to be probing to see, well, um, you know, do you have any record of, of that that's a round number? It's kind of unusual. Can you talk to me about how you charge your customers? Um, can you talk to me about, you know, who are your regular customers? Um, you know, can we, can we uh, maybe use, you know, your appointment books and, and figure out, you know, what days this would have come in, you know, do you have bank records, those kinds of things. It's, it's our job to, to probe adequately enough um, that we're doing our due diligence, that we're not just, um, you know, preparing something that's so wildly um, unbelievable that, you know, it's, it's just unreasonable to uh, prepare that kind of return and file it. So once we've made adequate inquiries and we're kind of figuring out what, what the taxpayer is going to need in order to uh, support their Schedule C deductions, income and deductions, we can help with some simple reconstruction. Um, again, this really commonly happens with uh, the clients that come in that maybe they did a little bit of ride share for a month or two and then it didn't work out. Um, and so, you know, we can use the apps and they've maybe only done a few rides and we can look up on, um, on Google Maps or a map uh, app and figure out how many miles they, they went. Um, and, you know, usually they'll, they'll kind of have an idea about what they were doing. Um, and the app really helps with that. If it's going to be more complicated, which does happen, um, we aren't really set up in a way to create extensive uh, reconstruction. So we might let them know, here's, here's what records you need to uh, pull together. Um, let's reschedule when you get, uh, and you work on getting those together, and then we can um, get your return prepared. Um, if, if it seems like it's going to be beyond what a non-expert uh, is going to be able to do, um, then we can also just say, you know, this year might be a good year to see a paid preparer to, to help you um, kind of get yourself organized. And then maybe in another year, uh, we, can, we can do your return for free. And here's a little more extensive list of the kinds of tools that uh, we can use to help figure out uh, what the income and expenses for the Schedule C were. So uh, if, if the client is keeping appointment books or calendars, you know, again, that helps with, you know, what was the purpose of the mileage, um, you know, what was happening, what was the business reason for this. Um, online map tools. Uh, the IRS standard allowances. So, you know, again, just like with uh, car and truck expenses, uh, you know, if people aren't keeping receipts, well, that's fine. As long as you can figure out how many business miles you had, you can take the standard um, allowance for mileage. Um, and then checkbooks and canceled checks. Um, banking apps are, are really helpful a lot of times. We have to pull those up or, or our clients need to pull those up and, and see, oh, wait, when did that income come in? Um, cash apps and accounting software. Um, there are free accounting apps uh, online. 
um, and and apps where uh, clients can take pictures of their receipts and that app will just store that picture. Um, so that's really helpful. There's a lot of tools that way that, um, you know, and usually our, our clients have their phones with them. So we can, we can say, hey, why don't you search up, you know, for an accounting app and let's see if we can get you set up with something. Um, and, and again, there's lots of free options. And then um, there's bank or credit card statements, um, lists of regular clients, partial receipts or sales tax records. Um, so, you know, if everything can't be found to the last penny, uh, you know, are we getting pretty close to where we're, you know, what we're filing um, largely is representative of, of what was happening. Um, and then the cell phone records, call history, computer logs, and prior year returns. 